That concludes the question and answer portion of our forum. We, the Faculty of Law at the University of Hong Kong is very fortunate in having some very distinguished honorary professors. Um, Henry Linton is an honorary professor, formerly a judge, a permanent judge of the Court of Final Appeal, um, has uh, kindly agreed to make some concluding remarks in his personal capacity. Professor Henry Linton. discussion and my remarks would focus really on only two areas. One, the very interesting concept of universal suffrage and in particular Article 26 of the Basic Law, the right to stand for election. Now what um, Professor Johannes Chan has put forward for discussion is that within the framework of the position of the Standing Committee on the 31st of August of this year, what scope is there for applying the concept of universal suffrage? And what he has put forward is the proposal that if the nomination committee could truly be broadly representative of the people of Hong Kong, then arguably this would be a step towards universal suffrage, if not the attainment of the ultimate goal. I find that an extremely interesting idea and he has actually put forward practical solutions or practical suggestions as to how uh, within the four categories constituting the nomination committee by looking more closely into the <coughs> subdivisions one might be able to achieve a fair degree of broad representation. It uh, seems to me that this is really a subject which is worthy of uh, analysis and debate all on its own. And um, I think uh, it's slightly regrettable that uh, there hasn't been more time devoted to the explore exploration of that idea. And I hope that uh, at some stage perhaps the, the uh, faculty would um, devote time uh, for a wider discussion on that subject. Now the uh, other matter of which I wish to speak is what uh, Ronnie Tong has uh, spoken about, emphasizing the importance that parties should comply court orders. Now I was intrigued right, right away when um, I realized that a civil court process was being invoked for what I feel is a public order issue. There are three separate actions that have been instituted, and I, as far as I can see, broadly speaking, the action instituted by the owners of Civic Tower stand on a rather different footing from the other two actions because that action seeks to protect rights of property. I was so intrigued by the other two actions that um, I went along to Mong Kok on Friday. And as you probably all remember, Friday was a very rainy day. And um, emerging from the MTR station, I was drenched with rain, and uh, I went around the site looking for the court order. It took me some considerable time to find it. <laughs> I did find it. It was stuck on a wall, 
in a plastic uh, uh, container, which by that time was filling up with water. <laughs> Alongside was another plastic uh, um, container, so something like, like this, um, with the affidavits in support. It was almost impossible to pull those affidavits out of the folder because there was so much water in the <laughs> in the plastic container that, and the papers were stuck together anyway. But doing the best I could, I was able to um, read the order. And in fact, I've got now um, a clean copy of it. <laughs> and the order was made on the 20th of October which was made on an ex parte basis. And um, it's obviously a private suit. This was between the uh, Tio Lun, um, Tio Lun Public Light Bus Company. And uh, the person named there as defendants are persons unlawfully occupying or remaining on the public highway. So that would immediately exclude me, because I was, I think, lawfully on that highway. Now, as um, Eric Chern has emphasized, this was an ex parte order. Now, the process of going to a court to seek an order behind the back of the person to be affected by the order is the most drastic remedy because the, the, the unvarying principle of the common law is that no one's interests should be affected without having been given the opportunity to be heard. But there are exceptional circumstances where a situation has arisen so urgent that it justifies making of an order, affecting his interest, behind his back, without his uh, being heard. So I was really intrigued, really on two bases. One, what was the urgency? And two, what was the occasion which demanded such drastic remedy? And um, I looked at the order, and uh, it's in the so in the English language when I went to Mong Kok. Uh, and uh, this is the document which is stuck on the wall, that uh, the defendant, whether by himself, his servant or agents, etc., be restrained from preventing the demolition or removal by the plaintiff, that is the uh, party that brought the suit, or his agents, uh, removing the temporary structures along the public highway. And um, I, I looked around the site to see what were these objects, which was the object, which was the focus of the first order. And these temporary structures, which were, were blocking the westbound highway of uh, the westbound carriageway of Argyle Street were massed, uh, what I think I call mills barriers, steel structures borrowed from, I think, the Hong Kong police. <laughs> um, and um, canopies um, erected on steel frames. Uh, platforms, and literally thousands and thousands of tents and other structures in a vast area. So what this order did was to restrain anyone from preventing the demolition of those structures. And, and of course it made sense. It made sense in this way, because there was urgency in these structures being removed instantly without reference 
to anyone who might be affected. And therefore, one assumes that the court would have considered what were the means whereby that object could be achieved. Uh, and trying the best I could reading the affidavit, which was not easily legible, I, I didn't uh, see anything said about um, bulldozers being brought in, dump trucks being brought in, contractors being engaged in order to come in on the 21st of October to remove the so-called temporary structures. So I, I, I just thought that this was a, an extremely odd order. And when I looked at it a bit further, I realized that um, the, um, the, the, the plaintiff was asked to give an undertaking that they would immediately serve the application, the affidavits, the, 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 the such orders that the might be made upon parties affected. So I said to myself, well, I mean, if the idea is that persons affected might be heard, why then was the order made at all without their being heard? Uh, and this was a, a very curious process. Now, the, well, that was the first of the four orders that I, I saw. The second order seems to be, in fact, made to reinforce the first. Because the second order is then to restrain persons from blocking up or obstructing, um, etc., etc. So presumably the intention is that the bulldozers, the dump trucks, would be brought in the next day. But to ensure that this clearing process could proceed without being frustrated, the persons are then restrained from putting things back into the roadway once they've been cleared. Now, all this is predicated upon the target of this order, which is urgent, immediate clearance of obstructions. And as far as I can see, that never happened before. So why an order was made on the 20th of October, I, I uh, am just simply mystified. Now, I believe that the, ma the matter has gone into parties. Um, I tried to go on to the website to see the precise order which was made last Monday. Uh, it doesn't seem to be publicly available as yet. Um, so what precise order was made then on Monday, I do not know. But I assume, uh, and my assumption could be completely wrong, that it's a continuation of this order. Uh, now, Remembering that this is a private suit, the Secretary for Justice, of course, has the power, and indeed one might say the duty, of a relator action when there is a public nuisance, and that the Secretary of Justice can institute, and I believe he can take over action in the public interest to enforce public rights. Now, how um, those who are the um, directors of um, the uh, Chilean Public Light Bus Company can undertake the, the task of enforcing now an order which I believe has been made in parties. Uh, and what assurance has been given to the court that it has the means at its disposal to enforce the order is something which um, I find again somewhat intriguing. Uh, presumably, those representing the plaintiff have satisfied the court that it has the means of enforcement because I cannot imagine that a court would continue 
an order when it is not satisfied that um, it can be enforced. Anything less would demean the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. That concludes this afternoon's forum. I'd like to thank the speakers for their participation. Professor Albert Chen, Professor Johannes Chan, Professor Eric Jern, Ronnie Tong, Mr.